episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Oh, welcome, everybody, once again to uh, another episode of our show with another really fascinating guest for you today, helping to create uh, a better tomorrow on, on many different fronts. And, and tonight, uh, we have the honor of being joined by none other than Dr. Dennis McKenna, uh, famed American ethnopharmacologist, pharmacognosist, lecturer, author, founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Uh, Dr. McKenna is a founding board member, the director of ethnopharmacology at the Hefter Research Institute, a uh, nonprofit organization concerned with the investigation of potential therapeutic uses of various psychedelic medicines. Uh, Dennis also serves on the advisory board of the American Botanical Council uh, as a founder and executive director for the Institute for Natural Products Research, as an independent research consultant to the phytomedicine and nutraceutical industry, uh, was formerly an editorial board of Phytomedicine, the International Journal of Phytotherapy and Phytopharmacology, uh, and is adjunct professor at the Center for Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. McKenna received his master's degree in botany from the University of Hawaii, uh, his PhD in botanical sciences at the University of British Columbia, and continued into postdoc uh, research fellowships uh, in the Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, as well as the Department of Neurology at Stanford University School of Medicine. Medicine. Uh, his research has led to the development of uh, uh, various natural products for the Aveda Corporation, as well as a much greater awareness of natural products and medicines uh, throughout the healthcare system. Uh, he has authored or co-authored numerous uh, peer-reviewed scientific papers, written a uh, numerous amount of books, including uh, uh, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, uh, My Life with Terence McKenna, uh, co-author of The Invisible Landscape, but also with his brother Terence, uh, and they were co-authors of the widely recognized reference work on uh, herbal medicines around the world in the title of Botanical Medicines, the best reference for major herbal supplements. His publications have appeared in, uh, in numerous journals, including the Journal of Ethnopharmacology, European Journal of Pharmacology, Brain Research, Journal of Neuroscience, Journal of Neurochemistry, uh, and a long other list. Uh, all that being said, uh, Dennis McKenna, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come talk to us on the show today. Well, thank you, Ira. It, it's always a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, your your kind introduction remind, which has consumed half our time, <laughs> right? <laughs> your, your introduction reminds me, I need to send you a much shorter and more up-to-date, uh, uh, you know, biographical sketch. We're working from an old script here. I mean, all those things are true, but we don't need to, you know, talk about it in such detail. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I'm glad to be here and, and thank you for uh, getting through all that. I'll send you a much shorter biography for the next time. <laughs> God, God. I, I, I enjoy reading your bio because I, I, aside from it's a, the amazing amount of work you've done, uh, it is a testament to... Uh, to uh, the last several decades of, uh, of knowledge that you've, you've built and shared with the, with the world. So I, I enjoy spending the time going through it. But anyway, you said, said, show me that shorter version. I, I can put it in the bio of the show later. But um, it's a testament to interdisciplinarity, I think. Exactly. And, uh, basically exactly. being all over the place. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, here we are. I, yeah. It's hard to believe it's been a couple of years since I've come on your podcast. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked a couple of years ago and you know a lot of what uh, I re just read through, uh, we talked about. Um, but I thought, you know, what, what I'd really like to do uh, on, on this particular episode is really start off uh, where we ended the last time, where uh, we were having a chat about your ideas for uh, what you formed since uh, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Um, if I could just read a little bit from the uh, the website um, that has you know, been developed since. Uh, uh, as a species and as individuals, we stand at the threshold of a critical moment in human history and perhaps in the survival and continued evolution of life on earth. Uh, those of us in this community, those of us have heard and heeded the message from Gaia's ambassadors, the plant teachers, are faced with this daunting responsibility as well as a great gift. Uh, and then you talk about the McKenna Academy as this unique incubator that is gonna nourish uh, the emergence of this new uh, embryonic global consciousness and, and, and basically uh, serve as a source for 
everyone around the world to, to further understand and learn from you. Uh, talk about what you've been doing the last couple of years in the development of, of the new school uh, and, and what's been happening. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, there. I think last time we talked, we were just getting started and uh, we've come a long way since then, uh, not necessarily in the directions that we anticipated. You know, but it's all good in a sense. So originally, the idea was that we were going to focus on, we we're basically an educational organization, as the name implies. We're an academy. We're kind of a think tank. We visualize our, our, our organization as being a mystery school in the spirit of Eleusis, you know, but with the 20th century overlay, you know, so we're somewhat like a mystery school. Uh, you know, one of the ancient mystery schools, and they were a little bit like think tanks like Esalen and so on, sure. except much smaller, much more poorly financed, much less known than Esalen, but that's what we aspire to, you know, that, that kind of thing, a place where brilliant ideas and brilliant people can come together to discuss the issues of our time, or anything else we're interested in. You know, people say, well, it's the mystery school. What is the mystery? The mystery is the mystery of existence. The, the, the sort of, it's an excuse for talking about any darn thing we want to discuss, you know, but, the, but at the core of it, you know, it's the sort of the, to join together in marveling what a, what a miraculous universe we inhabit and how unlikely it is we find ourselves in it and asking these questions, you know, and, and it's curiosity driven, it's, uh, it's science driven, but it, it uh, you know, we called it the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy because natural philosophy is the precursor of what's, it's what science grew out of before science became quantitative, reductionist, sometimes boring, sometimes not admitting or not willingly acknowledging that there are other ways to, of knowing, you know, and natural philosophy included that. So our perspective is a little wider than just a strictly scientific reductionist perspective. At the same time, we don't want to be branded as flakes, you know, so we're sort of, you know, uh, we're sort of on that edge there where we're open to lots of ideas and, and lots of conversations without necessarily saying, this is what we believe. What we believe, what the Academy's, you know, sort of perspective and mission is, people need to learn to think for themselves, you know, and we can present all sorts of ideas, but the academy exists to stimulate thought, not to tell people what to think, but to hopefully teach people or help people learn for themselves how to think, you know, because there's a lot of that, the other thing going on, you know, uh, Ira, it seems to be a, seems to be a uh, characteristic of the human species that we're comfortable, you know, if somebody comes along and says, here's a set of ideas, all you have to do is believe this and you'll be fine, you know, and we totally reject that, you know, we say, you know, I don't need other people to tell me what I'm supposed to think, I want to learn myself to think how to, how to do it, and that's what the academy wants to do, and we want people to join in originally our idea and it still is you know I mean a central idea to the founding of it was that we wanted to do conferences and retreats in primarily in South America uh, but maybe other places as well and that's that kind of built on what we were doing before we actually formally founded the academy. I was working with uh, a person who is now the executive director, uh, Christina Chaya, uh, and we were just organizing ayahuasca retreats in the Sacred Valley. And then uh, after doing that for a few years, we decided to found this academy. And then COVID came along and completely changed, you know, derailed our business plan, uh, you know, everything else that we'd aspire to. So we had to pivot and become a virtual organization, which is what we are now. And we 
you know, we hope to go back to doing retreats at some point, but who knows when, you know, I mean, just COVID is dictating everything and nobody can make plans. But in the meantime, we've, we've developed a pretty good online uh, presence. We've been organizing events and collaborating with other groups on different events. And, uh, you know, we've done a couple virtual symposia. Uh, we have a podcast. Uh, you've probably heard the recent uh, uh, podcast I did with Tim Ferriss, which mm -hmm. was a, yep. you know, very significant for us because of his reach and and also, he's he's a wonderful interviewer. I, I I really enjoyed our, and that's got us attention. So, uh, on the organizational level, initially we you know this we incorporated in 2019, mm -hmm. shortly after I moved to Canada, and we incorporated as a Canadian nonprofit, and then that turns out turned out not to be the best idea because of being able to give tax deductions and so on. So we re-registered as a 501c3 in the States and that's where we're registered now with the IRS. We have, we have that designation so we can give people tax deductions if they're so inclined to, to, to support us that way. And uh, we're actually beginning a big capital campaign to try to raise some funds which I guess is pretty much what you do when you're a nonprofit, you're always trying to raise funds. Uh, but we've got some interesting projects, you know, projected and, and uh, in the pipeline, uh, which, which I can explain in, in detail or I can, or not, depending on what, what you would like to hear. Yeah, I, I, I would love to um, you know, continue a little bit down this path of, uh, of the, you know, the mystery school, uh, you know, you, you write about something that's near and dear to you. You were just talking about sort of, um, the, sort of the reductionist model that a lot of people may think about in terms of uh, ethnopharmacology and sort of traditional natural product research. But, you know, here in the mission, um, you, you know, you mentioned that obviously uh, these, these plant teachers are, are not just these single purified elements. There are, there are these fascinating mixtures of, of bioactive moieties. And then on top of that, as in sort of this part about the, the, the nexus and the mixture school, you talk about how they don't exist naturally in isolation. They're part of cultures, land, spiritual traditions of the people. Talk a little bit about this theme, if you would, a little further. And then if, yeah, if you could obviously nothing confidential, but if you could elaborate on a little bit, are you doing primarily ayahuasca work? Are you working with other ethnomedicines? Uh, talk a little bit about sort of the, uh, the therapeutic side here. And then you're, you talk about new models of wellness never seen before. So if you could elaborate on that, I, I think it'd be really cool. Uh, sure. Uh, we uh, are, uh, uh, because we've had to go virtual, a lot of you know, uh, therapeutics and, and doing ayahuasca retreats or retreats with other sacred medicines are uh, are part of the plan, but but less so because it presupposes that we would do this in a physical place. And, you know, the last uh, actual physical uh, retreat that we did under the umbrella of the mystery school was November 2019 and we did a 10-day retreat which was called the mystery school retreat in in the Sacred Valley of Peru uh, involving uh, uh, one of my favorite teachers and mentors a man named Alexandre Tanu who is a sound therapist and a brilliant man he knows incredible amounts about sound from you know the physics and the mathematics to the history mm -hmm. to the spiritual uses of of sound and that was a tremendous event and uh it was very well received and that was our first formal event under the banner of the uh mckenna academy and that was our last physical event since then we have been doing online events. We did a tribute. My, my brother yep. uh, passed away in uh, April uh, 2000. So we did a 20th 
anniversary, on the 20th anniversary of his death for the next few weeks, we did some retrospectives about him, uh, mainly conversations with different old friends of his that, that knew him. So it was a, a reminiscence fest. Uh, we had, uh, also we had, we did some, we, we did an event with uh, Merlin Sheldrake Sure. Uh, talking about his book, uh, Entangled Life. We did one with uh, Brian Marareskew, the fellow that wrote The Immortality Key. Yep. So we're just trying to present these different stimulating uh, opportunities to discuss ideas, which is what you're supposed to do in an academy in that sort of Socratic tradition. So not that we're, you know, I mean, we're, we're not a cult. You don't have to believe any of this. We're not pushing that. We're an anti-cult, you know? We're saying, we don't know what's going on. Think for yourself. We're all, you know, and that's been my perspective all my life is that, you know, number one, curiosity is what drives discovery, you know, particularly in science. And it's always been important to me just to desire to understand the world better. Uh, and, and so, you know, with that in mind, there's lots to be curious about, you know, almost everything. So the scope of what we can address in, uh, you know, in the academy includes everything. For example, uh, uh, we're planning a, uh, a virtual symposium, uh, probably a one day virtual symposium on the stone date theory. Yep which everyone probably knows about. And the reason for that is, the reason to revisit this is a couple of things. One is that uh, the, my brother's book, The Food of the Gods has been reprinted. There's a new, a new edition of it. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a foreword for the new edition. And, uh, and then Michael Pollan's second book has come out. I was recently with Michael Pollan, uh, in a event that was uh, organized by uh, Penguin Books UK, mostly to promote Michael's book, but Terence's book is also uh, printed by them. So we're organizing this symposium to sort of revisit this theory, you know, and uh, uh, partly to promote the book, but partly because there's actually new evidence that supports the theory. And uh, I want to present that and discuss that. And we have some very, uh, we have possibly Michael Pollan will join that conversation. Uh, but some other people that have looked into this uh, are, I think we're going to have some very interesting speakers. You know, one of them will be uh, Dr. David Luke, who Sorry. you may have heard of. Yep. And he has done extraordinary work on psychedelics and uh and what he calls extraordinary human experiences, uh, and also a lot of work on synesthesia. Okay. And synesthesia is sort of a core concept in my mind to this stone date theory that the, you know, that the mushrooms associated with evolving hominids and, you know, possibly as long as two million years ago, could have played a role in the origin of language and the imagination and the ability to visualize basically. And that's all, that is sort of the core uh, functions, core reflection of, uh, well, I guess what we could call consciousness or human consciousness as we understand those things. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the ideas that I think uh, substantially support it now uh, or could be marshaled to support it, let's say, were not even on the radar when Terence wrote the book. You know, mm. the book was written in 1993. What we didn't understand at that point was this concept of neuroplasticity sure. and epigenetics. And these two mechanisms, I think, sort of move the, the needle on this hypothesis to you know, maybe, possibly, plausible to more than likely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the reason it's more than likely is that we know that, for example, psilocybin can, and we're talking about psilocybin here, we're talking about this 
posited co-evolutionary relationship between hominids, cattle, and mushrooms, which had to be in this environment. You know, right. we know that they were, uh, that it was much wetter in that region, Northern Africa at that time. We know there were cattle there. Yep. There's fossil evidence for that. And we know there were hominids there. And we know that there was actually a ferment. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of, it's kind of an oxymoron to talk about a ferment of evolution <laughs> because evolution is a slow process, you know, but we know from fossil record that there is this relatively rapid uh, growth in the size and complexity of the human brain starting sure. about 2 million years ago. Yep. And over that period, it's increased, it's at least tripled in size. That's a very short time span, uh, evolutionarily speaking, for that kind of thing to happen. And this neuroplasticity, we know that uh, psilocybin can actually increase connectivity in the brain. This is why it's being looked at, for example, for traumatic brain injury and mm -hmm. possibly even a treatment for stroke. It actually can re, uh, I guess, rewire, re-architecture neural connectivity in the brain. And the idea is that, you know, in increased levels of connectivity reflect an increased level of of conscious of conscious activity so you have a mechanism in this environment with these with these uh, three elements in the symbiotic relationship you know the cattle the hominids and the mushrooms which kind of inevitably would show up in that environment if you if you look at any uh, tropical pastoral ecosystem these days if you go anywhere in the tropics that has rainfall and cattle you're going to find these mushrooms right. I mean, <clears throat> you know so so the idea is that uh you know over periods of evolutionary time there was this increase in complexity and connectivity and and general uh, of, of the human brain and Epigenetics is the other part of this because epigenetics provides a mechanism for cross-generational transmission of these types of, of uh, inherited traits that do not involve conventional mechanisms. So that's what we're going to explore in this, uh, in this symposium, which we're going to have one of these days, <laughs> hopefully soon, maybe October, November. We've been... Uh, we're looking for, we're shooting for October, November. Uh, one of our problems, Ira, is that, you know, we're, we're a small outfit and, and we're kind of perpetually uh, stretched for our bandwidth, basically. Sure. Uh, we need more people and we need more resources to really sort of... Uh, rise to the occasion and be able to create these programs. So that's one reason we're doing a capital campaign, uh, just so we can expand our base. Uh, and, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing on, on the, uh, on the teaching level. And then we are doing some, uh, some research as well. Well, no, I should mention, uh, we're actually, uh, as far as teaching, uh, Another interesting project that we're doing, uh, we've uh, formed a collaboration with the uh, Organization for Tropical Studies, which okay. is based in Costa Rica. And uh, we're, we're co-developing an ethnobotany course with them in conjunction with them, which will be, you know, a real course with even accreditation and that kind of thing. And it'll be about a 15 to 17 week course graduate level and uh hopefully people will be attracted to it you know there's uh it's hard to find uh conventional academic institutions these days that offer something like this in ethnobotany i mean there are maybe if even if you measure in botany you can have you know, maybe one course, you know, plants and human affairs or something, right. but nothing that really del delves into the the subject. So, so we're going to present this course starting around the middle of September, 
And, uh, you know, many, many people have approached me and approached the Academy and, and asked, well, you know, so you say you're, that you're an Academy, you know, where can I enroll? And mm -hmm. we'll hear you, you can enroll, you know, we're going to, and this may be the first of a number of courses that we can, that we can develop, but that, that depends on lots of things, mostly expanded capacity. So we've got that program going. And then on the research uh, side of things, uh, I suppose you could call it research, uh, we are doing this, uh, this project called the Knowledge Preservation Project, okay. uh, which we're sort of branding as Biognosis. Uh, and it's, a, it's a basically a three part uh, project, uh, long-term project, each part becoming, you know, costing more and taking longer and all that. But the initial, the initial part of it is to uh, make a documentary that uh, uh, doc documents the knowledge of, of this, this botanist in Peru that I've worked with for over 40 years. And ever since I went there as a graduate student, and this this gentleman is a really unique character because he has one foot in science and one foot in traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. He's the director of the herbarium at the university in Iquitos, uh, but he grew up in Iquitos. His father was a was a traditional healer, uh, and and he knows that side of it as well as the botanical side. The problem is he doesn't write anything down, mm. you know, so he's got this head full of information and he's not getting any younger. And he's one of these people about which it's said when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Juan Ruiz, he is that library. And uh, we want to uh, document using videography, basically much of what we do, what he knows and go into the field with him and go to the herbarium and talk about the plants that, you know, are significant to him and, and kind of the whole, whole uh, scene of uh, ethnomedicine as it's, as it is now the contemporary scene, the sort of post COVID post ayahuasca tourism uh, environment for traditional medicine in the Amazon. So, this documentary will be the first, and then hopefully from that, depending on uh, if that can be used to attract funding, we will we will uh, continue and do a series of uh, short documentaries about traditional medicine in the yeah. Amazon and the, and sort of the current state of it, and uh, then if we can that the. the the, the third and final and most difficult and maybe most unlikely phase of it because of costs and so on. But the third part of it is to uh, basically take this herbarium at the university, you know, mm -hmm. which is a typical third world herbarium. It has a lot of deficiencies, but it has a number of collections. It could be a world-class institution for, uh, plant medicine research in the Amazon. So that's what we're going to try and do is, uh, is actually uh, digitize the herbarium mm -hmm. and uh, uh, put all the specimens, images online, link them into different databases. There's even been discussions about creating a virtual rainforest idea. We've talking to some different VR geniuses, and they said, "Well, you know, you could make the you could make this a three dimensional immersive environment." And I'm all for that. You know, um, how much is it going to cost? Right. Who knows? But probably <laughs> a fair a, probably a fair amount. I mean, this, but you know, this would be two or three. It'll be probably at least two years downstream. And once we get into it, it'll take at least two years to do it. But I think it's worthwhile. And, you know, it's it's just one thing we can do to try and help, you know, preserve the knowledge, the habitats, 
and the plants, yep. you know, uh, and so this is uh, this is the kind of research side of what we're trying to do. Yeah, that. Um, but it, it, it's all extremely important. But that last part, you know, I was, um, I think, a little bit after I talked to you last time, I actually uh, had time to spend with a um, one of the tribal leaders of the uh, the Warani peoples, and they're in Ecuador, um, and and they had recently come off this. Uh, major win uh, in court against the Ecuadorian government, which was trying to chop down, you know, half a million acres of their area. And, and, um, and as we were talking about uh, just, you know, the things in the, in the rainforest there in Ecuador, you know, she brought up these concepts of, you know, uh, preserving the spirit of the jaguar, which I, I, you know, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but obviously we know what that means. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's so, you know, timely and important that this, obviously everything you're doing, but the specific part about uh, we're losing so much of this knowledge that you say it's not documented, it's in these minds and these amazing people that are there. Um, and we right. have to- They are there. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, uh, yeah, this is, this is one of the things, I mean, you know, I guess part of the, the reason to do this is uh, if you can link any plant to a piece of information, you know, you've provided a rationale not to drive it into extinction. Yeah. You know, so, and every plant has value. And the there have been numerous studies that show related to land use and, and development of resources in the Amazon, you know, you can't necessarily just fence these, these places off. You can't fence off the cultures, you know, uh, you, you, you can try to set aside large amounts of land that are not exploited, right. but ideally you want to find sustainable and ethical ways to, to utilize those resources without depleting the resources. So you're talking about non-timber forest products yep. and that yep. sort of thing. Yep. And if you look at the different usage scenarios, it's clear that you know, if, if you exploit a given area, given 50 hectares or 100 hectares of rainforest for sustainable products, such as nuts and fruits, and, you know, this kind of thing that can be sustainably extracted, the value per hectare is like three times what it is if you just cut it down and bring in cattle or, or, you know, soybean plantations or oil palm plantations or all of these things, which are, you know, all based on the monoculture concept. And right. it's not really suited to the Amazon. Yeah. What we have to do is develop the Amazon as, uh, as it once existed, yep. you know? I mean, the Amazon, people think of the Amazon as a, uh, you know, trackless wilderness. It was not that, you know, before the Spanish came, before the the smallpox moved in and, you know, ahead of the Spanish and decimated these populations, there were 80 million people living in the Amazon, yeah. you know, and it was a sustainable permaculture based system, you know, yeah. and because, you know, archaeologically, there's no, there's very little stone in the Amazon. So, you know, you can't really get a handle on it, but you can do it using uh, satellite, uh, uh, you know, uh, earth penetrating radar techniques mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. various aerial, uh, you know, aerial techniques where you can see the infrastructure of these, uh, you know, aquifers and, and uh, uh, you know, aquaculture, installations and and you know uh, the and uh, you know the Amazon is notorious for having poor soil that's true because all of the nutrients that are released into the environment are immediately taken up by other living things around them but the populations that lived in this area developed this uh, artificial soil uh, you know that was basically uh, called Terra Pietra. They created their own soil, and there's hundreds of square miles of this soil, which again shows that it was under intense cultivation at the time. So, uh, you know, and we forget, you know, maybe 
and maybe we conveniently forget, you know, because the ingression of, of the West into the Amazon basically destroyed these cultures and destroyed much of the environment. And that continues, you know, yeah. uh, I don't have to tell you the Amazon is one of the most uh, stressed areas on the planet right now. Yeah. And, you know, along with every other part of the planet, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not a pretty picture, Ira. I tell you, we're under a lot of stress. I don't, you don't need me to tell you that, you know. Uh, I mean, it, it's reading the, the uh, reports coming out of the latest uh, international panel on climate change. You know, we are coming to a tipping point. You know, we've been approaching it. And for a long time, it's been, well, you know, in 20 years, you know, and then it's, well, in 10 years, well, now, guess yeah. what? We're here, yeah. you know, and we have to quickly make some changes uh, if we're going to, if, if we're going to continue on this planet, at least if our species is going to survive, you know, uh, I, I, I don't worry much about life surviving on the planet. Life is very adaptive and the oh, planet's sure. gone through huge changes over the course of evolutionary time uh, and managed to bounce back. And often some of these catastrophic events, extinction events result in a, you know, a, a, an increase in uh, biodiversity and speciation and all that after they happen. But these are, these are processes that work out over you know, tens of millions of years. Yeah. Uh, we do not have that kind of time, yeah. you know, and we have to make some decisions and we have to do it rather quickly, you know. So so this is what we're faced with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know. It, it, I, I feel like in a, I feel in a kind of an awkward situation in a way. You know, because people expect me to have an optimistic, uplifting message. It's getting harder and harder <laughs> to deliver that. I, I you understand. know, if I'm going to be honest, you know, yeah. uh, you you have to you have to wonder, not sugarcoat it. There's no, no sugarcoating to be done. We are in a serious crisis. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> hopefully the mechanics academies of the world can. Uh, uh, Teach us. Uh, or, or, well, I mean, there, you know, I mean, there, are, get, there are yeah. lots like us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not that there aren't brilliant people and creative solutions out right. there. The question is, how quickly can they be brought right. online? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the plant teachers, the, the, the particularly the traditional psychedelics, are part of this mix, you know, because they're an important part because they, uh, are a way of reminding us basically how far out of sync we are with nature, how how disharmonic with nature we become. Yep. And that's the core of the problem. And they can be a wake-up call and you know a realization. And many people are getting that realization. The question is, what do you do with it once you have it? You know, and uh, it, it's not enough simply to have the experience, you know. You have to you have to make an effort to ensure that the right people have the experience, yes. you know, uh, so that they can they have the power and the money and the resources to make a difference, yep. you know. And if if we lack that, then uh, you know, then it's a problem. Let's um let's talk about that a little bit because I know this is not um, d directly in the sense of of the traditional plant teachers, but um, the last couple of years has seen a tremendous amount of uh, investment capital go into what I'll call the pharmaceuticalization of uh, the plant teachers. We see uh, various uh, moieties based on psilocybin, ibogaine, uh, some synthetic substances that we talked about also, traditional synthetic substances uh, being repurposed. Um, talk, a, I mean, give me a little bit of your, we, we talked about this a couple of years ago, but it's come a lot further now. Um, a lot further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do you think these initiatives help uh, in, in terms of 
aware. Obviously, they're not the plant teachers. They are highly synthetic, modified versions of them. But do they help in the mission uh, in, in sort of getting the, the thinking moving that, hey, there's important ethnopharmacology here that uh, well, yes. I mean, yes. In general, I'm I'm encouraged by that. I think even ten years ago, I don't think we would have envisioned that it would have come to this, right. you know. And so, in general, the fact that the value of these medicines is being recognized is very encouraging, you know. And the fact that uh, you know that the uh, you know, I mean, I mean, suddenly the 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 checkered reputation of psychedelics has now been elevated, and people are beginning to realize that they are solutions for a lot of the mental illnesses that sort of plague our society, in particular. You know, trauma, uh, alcoholism, addiction, uh, intractable depression, all of those things. There's a lot of that going going on. And these things can potentially ameliorate these things. Uh, so that's a good thing. I think it's important to recognize that that's only a fraction of what psychedelics can do for us right. as a species in terms of healing. Uh, you know, they are, uh, you know, you don't have to be mentally ill to benefit from them. They can right. benefit well people in terms of reframing this mindset, you know, and helping to reframe our perspective about our relationship with nature. So what's happening in the, in the sort of venture capital commercial sector with psychedelics is, uh, uh, it's a mixed bag, actually. I think that, I mean, I'm encouraged by it. I'm glad to see that these things are being recognized and, and explored, you know, therapeutically. Uh, they definitely are a superior generation of, uh, of medicines and, and the institutions of psychiatry are pretty well broken anyway, you know, and that's largely because of their over-reliance on the traditional psychopharmaceuticals, which don't really get to the root of the problem. Sure. Psychedelics can be tools for helping people to actually get to the root of their problems and, and find cures, you know, so that they don't have to take them the rest of their lives a few well-structured sessions and they can get rid of the depression or the trauma or whatever it is that they're, that they want to heal from. Uh, but the other, you know, less encouraging side or, or uh, of this thing is that uh, uh, by necessity, the way that clinical trials are structured and so on, it requires you know, it's based on synthetics primarily. I don't think there are many natural medicines, uh, natural psychedelics in clinical trials. And uh, there's a sort of failure to recognize the context that these things came out of, which of course is traditional, traditional practices, traditional shamanic practices. And I don't think it's necessarily for necessarily that we want to imitate those you know, we can't, we're not indigenous people, but we mm -hmm. can learn from those traditions. We can learn better ways to use them. And then I think the scientific and the, you know, uh, venture capital communities that are, that are funding this, they have a responsibility to give back, you know, and they should try and build reciprocity into their, their development plans rather than the traditional way it's been with with natural medicines is pharmaceutical companies come along and they, you know, they take the genetics, they take the the plants and, and the applications, and very rarely give anything back to the indigenous people that have been sort of the the stewards of this knowledge and the habitats and their traditions for millennia. So hopefully people in the psychedelic space are a little more enlightened. Hopefully their psychedelic experiences have enlightened them a little bit more that this is, this is ethically, this is dubious, you know, and they need to rethink their ethical stance and make a, make a serious commitment to, uh, 
you know, give back to the indigenous people in, in some substantial way, you know, uh, and then that's easy to say. And then we have to get into, well, what are the details of that? How do you actually implement that? But there are ways to be found. The important thing is you have to make the commitment. And some, some companies are stepping up to the plate and others not. So it's very interesting, uh, you know, to watch this, uh, this movement of, of psychedelics uh, toward the mainstream and the whole sort of venture capital maneuvering that's going on around this. Uh, I think that uh, at least here in Canada, and that's, that's where a lot of these startup, these psychedelic startups are, at least here in Canada, uh, uh, you know, what I, what I see is there's a mindset that many of the people that are investing in psychedelics were previously in cannabis, you know, and they think, well, we, we made a killing in cannabis, which is actually not true. You know, I mean, the cannabis industry up here is a disaster, as it turns out. It has not worked out the way people expected. But they say, well, now let's jump into the psychedelic space and we'll cash in on that, too. Not going to work that way. I don't think you can make it work that way because of the very nature of psychedelics. You know, they are not things that you can consume daily as you could cannabis if you choose to they're not a commodity what the value you know the value of uh you know in a business sense the value to be found in psychedelics is not necessarily about producing the medicines and selling the medicines the that's only a component of it the the it these medicines have to be used in a intense therapeutic context. You know, they're not take two and call me in the morning, you right. know, or it, they just don't work that way. So what we, so it's the value of in the business sense is the, the, the uh, context that's provided, the therapeutic support services that are provided around the use of psychedelics. You know, it's a, it's a total package mm -hmm. involving mm -hmm. preparation and then the experience or the experiences, whether it's one or a series of experiences, and then the integration of what is, what is learned. Those things all have to go together. And that's the way you develop a, a, a viable approach to the therapeutic use of, uh, of psychedelics. Of course, what that means is if you do that, it means that you completely have to re turn psychiatry and mental health care on its head, you know, because it doesn't work that way right, right now. What? I mean, it, it, Good. But just because, you know, it doesn't, it's not about the substances, right? And, right. and it, it involves making the commitment to uh, a therapist's time, which is yeah. probably the most important, most valuable component of this, of this interaction. So how do you make that work cost effectively? How do you make it work in models where, uh, you know, eventually you have to be asking insurance to pay for this and this sort of thing. So there's nothing simple about any of this. That doesn't mean there are not solutions. Right. You know, Dennis, you know, we, we, we've, we talked about sort of the, uh, the plant teachers that most people know or at least heard about in terms of psilocybin, ibogaine, ayahuasca, uh, which you spent a lot of time on. Um, in, in your time out there uh, in nature, uh, when you were putting together the desk reference and, and, and a lot of the ethnopharmacological tools over the years, are there, are there things that you, are there plant teachers that you wanted to see of the popularity of some of these ones that we've been mentioning that sort of never made it to the, the four or other side of that, you know, obviously when, when we talk about natural product research, you know, we always hear we've only scratched the surface of the hundreds of thousands of species that are out there of, of higher plants, let alone lower and, right. and the fungi. Um, you know, if I, if I was to give you a $10 billion and send you, <laughs> send you in a team out for a while, I, I mean, 
where, what would you do? I mean, I, I, where, where would you go explore? Um, or is, is this even a viable, uh, uh, $10 billion, is this an exercise that you would think of doing? Are we, are, do you think we have enough plant teacher tools today? Um, and we want to work a lot more on, as you were saying, sort of the structure of how these things are, are really utilized. That's not just the, 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 the compound, but the setting and so forth. Um, and there's a couple parts of that question, but I really want to throw those at you as well. Well, uh, uh... Well, send me ten million dollars, and we'll figure out. No, it was ten billion, but I... <laughs> oh, ten million. Okay, well, well, B with a B, uh, a billion. Uh, with yeah. a with a with a B, it would be much better. There's yeah. a lot we could do with a B, you know. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it it does require probably very high levels of investment. I mean, yeah. people have talked about, uh, you know, not just in terms of psychedelics, but tried to figure out what is the Amazon worth? Right. You know, what would it take to uh, leverage this resource in a sustainable way that would preserve it, that would get the most benefit out of it for our species and yet maintain these environments, these habitats, and the traditional people that live in these habitats, they're yep. the keepers of the knowledge. How can we do all of that sustainably. And that is that is much harder to figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it has been, and I think it's something that you could do. Uh, if you've got to approach it probably at the at the international level through NGOs and this sort of thing, maybe the uh, UN uh, level agencies like the, uh, you know, uh, UNESCO and, and this sort of thing, scientific organizations, food and agriculture. Uh, but if you had that, and if you had a, uh, you know, a pharmaceutical industry that wasn't necessarily predatory capitalism, uh, if they were less concerned with this, you know, the problem with uh, the capitalist approach, at least in this drug discovery uh, sphere is they want to make the discoveries and then they want to make it so that no one else can make the discoveries and it's all about patents and intellectual properties and all that. If you could create a model where uh, you know these companies are putting significant amounts of investment into preserving these environments, you know, th uh, that's where the commitment's got to come and and it requires. Uh, you know, it requires a, an ability to look ahead beyond the next quarter, you know, or beyond sure. the next two quarters or beyond the next five years. It needs to be a 50 to 100 year horizon of development. And I don't see that happening. You know, I, I think we're as a species, we have a hard time looking that far ahead. You know, I mean, it, it just if you look at the particular, if you look at the climate crisis right now, we could have woken up 30 years ago and we wouldn't be saying having these problems as yeah. much. I mean, we would have them, but we'd have solutions well underway. We're very good at denial and just, you know, we don't, we don't admit it's happening. So it's not a problem, you know, and this is, this is uh, going to work to our, our, uh, you know, to our, eventually to our destruction, but to our disadvantage. I mean, you're familiar, you're a natural product scientist, right? So you know that only a fraction of the total number of known plant species have really been seriously looked at for potentials for new medicines in, yeah. in any therapeutic area. And usually the track record shows that when that is done, it pays off, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, you can do all kinds of combinatorial chemistry, you can take synthetic approaches and all that. And that sometimes comes up with therapeutic compounds and, and the pharmaceuticals companies like that because they own that lock, right. stock and barrel. They don't have to pay off any indigenous tribes. They don't have to pay off foreign governments and all that. Natural products work, uh, you know, in the drug discovery field is messy because of all of these, uh, you know, 
agreements and frameworks that you have to build a la- around it to let this work go forward. But that doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile. Sure. You know, uh, I mean, it, it could be. I, I'm convinced that, uh, essentially, I mean, I would like to believe that for every ill that, that affects humanity, somewhere in the natural world, there is a medicine that could treat it. You yeah. know, and, I mean, maybe that's an irrational idea that I would love that to be true. And I believe it probably is true, but we just have to go find those. And if we let, if we put the resources we put into, uh, you know, proprietary drug development, if we put similar resources into supporting research in the natural, into the, you know, the global biome for natural products, uh, it would pay off, uh, you know, the discoveries would definitely pay off over time uh, but it takes the broad perspective and it takes a perspective you know that that is uh, realistic about the time frames involved sure. the investments that are needed you know it's uh you know it's it's difficult um but there certainly are things to be discovered including new psychedelics yeah. you know mm-hmm. i mean I, I i i'm sure they're out there i mean i i know of a few uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we necessarily have to go on that search. I mean, we have very good psychedelics, you know, sure. it's hard to, it's hard to conceive of a, of a psychedelic that is say more suited to human use than psilocybin. Right. I mean, psilocybin is almost the ideal clinical psychedelic. You know, it's non-toxic. The time frame of the experience is just about right, you know, for a clinical study. Uh, there's no issue with supply, mm-hmm. you know, because you can grow these things. That is an issue with things like iboga and ayahuasca and sure. these things. There's tremendous pressure on these. And so we have to be, uh, we have to be aware of that. And, and you know, we, we, we have to develop sustainable sources of of those things if they're going to be brought into medicine mushrooms you can grow by the ton yeah you know so there is no supply issue uh i'm kind of amused sometimes at these at these startup companies that you know they're focused on psilocybin and they're trying to find some way to improve on this you know we've got to come up with an analog or mm-hmm. you know give it in conjunction with this that or the other thing to come up with a proprietary uh you know formulation and and the fact is it's just about as perfect as it can be in its natural form and of course the synthetic as well so uh you know is this really advancing therapeutics or is this just basically uh an effort to make something proprietary, right. you know, in that. So, so we'll see. We will see. <laughs> we'll definitely see. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, Des, you, you mentioned um, the, uh, the tribute to your brother, uh, Terrence, uh, it was earlier in 2020, uh, the new uh, reprint of Food of the Gods is, I think it's now, I, I saw an image of it, it looked really cool. Uh, I think you put it on Facebook the other day. Um, any other things that I have missed in terms of uh, this next part of 2021? Things you want to tell me, tell the audience about? Please, I'll just you know hand you the floor if I've if I've uh, not asked any about, about things you wanted to talk about. Well, I I think we've uh, I think we pretty well covered it. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, this is what we're doing. Uh, we are we're uh, hopeful for the for our capital campaign, our fundraising campaign, uh, which we're just getting started. You know, and a lot of people uh, know about us. They want to support the account. I mean, they like the idea. The question mm-hmm. is, how can they tangibly support it? Well, you know, we're we're a nonprofit. So we're happy to accept donations, but it goes beyond that. You know, we need people with uh, talent and energy and good ideas and more connections. And, and that's all of what you need to grow 
to grow the academy and give us more more capabilities you know uh so uh you know i i would hope that in within five years if we're successfully raising funds that we may actually have a, a permanent a physical location in in South America, which is kind of where we started out uh, with this idea. But you know, COVID has really upset the the apple cart of the world. You know, I, I have a I have a I don't know if you've read any of my blogs on the Academy website, but I wrote one a while back that was basically, you know, the 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 theme of it was the world as we know it has already ended, mm -hmm. you know, and we're in this post, you know, this strange post-apocalyptic uh era where, you know, now it seems that the pandemic is uh gonna be with us for a while and undoubtedly is not the last pandemic that we'll have to deal with in this century you know so uh we need to uh you know as i've always said ira i mean my my shtick is you know we've got to wake up yep. you know and the the psychedelics are the catalyst to help us wake up you know but then we have to wise up in the sense that we have to get wise, we have to think about it. So we've had the wake up call, then how do we implement that realization in the real world in an mm -hmm. effective way? And that's where it becomes important to connect the right people and the right ideas and give, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't have that kind of influence, you know, we need people that are truly world changing people who are also enlightened <laughs> and i don't know if you get that combination i mean somebody like tim forrest for example is a tremendous influencer and uh you know but even he has more or less the same message you do as well it's not that we don't understand you know what the issues are the question is you know how to how to bring that message to a wider world. And, uh, you know, uh, that's where I'm flummoxed, you know? I mean, the, the, you know, how do we, for example, well, you know, I, I don't know if you follow politics, you probably do. I probably follow it a bit more than I should, but, uh, you know, it's disturbing to, you know, see how, what a, what a, crude instrument political change is you know you can't even have a conversation about climate change or some of these things that are so important to us because everyone has you know their own and they're either in denial about it or they just don't want to talk about it at all so that's a problem yeah. you know how, how do we get off fossil fuels within the next 10 years if we even have 10 years you know having how, how do we do that? That's kind of a basic thing. If how do we, uh, you know, a deforestation is yeah. another example of the same thing. Deforestation of tropical ecosystems and other ecosystems. I mean, it doesn't have to be tropical. You know, California's on fire. A good deal of British Columbia is on fire. Yeah. You know, uh, and so this is a tremendous. Uh, you know, uh, adding to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The solution is simple, put out the fires, you know. But of course, in California, that's not an option. But in the Amazon, the fires are deliberately set. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. There are better ways to use that resource. But then you have... You know, uh, Bolsonaro, for example, is like a mini Trump. In some ways, he's worse than Trump, you know, because he is the president of a country that should be taking the lead in yeah. terms yeah. of preserving the tropical rainforests. And, and it's not happening, you know. So I don't know. Uh, maybe we should end our podcast getting into some fairly, <laughs> fairly dark places here. Well, but that's... That's yeah, I mean, but, but you know, it's a, it's a wake up call. And it's, you know, I, um, 
I like to, there's a, one part uh, on your uh, uh, discussion of the, uh, the the catalytic nexus in the mystery school where you basically say, hey, we're 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 on the cusp of history's end. We are suspended on our journey between ape and angel, and hey, we have to wake up, as you're saying, and and keep going, um, and 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 not uh, uh, forget this path. And it's just. Uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, these are some deep topics. Uh, some are not the happiest, but um, I, I'm I'm glad you're you're still there plugging away, Dennis, and 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 making us think uh, deeper uh, and giving us a forum to uh, through through these initiatives to, uh, as you say, think uh, and and not just listen to what other people are telling us. But um, you know, I, I want to really wish you the best with with these initiatives. I hope, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, uh, that that we can get things going much faster uh uh with the academy. Um I want to help spread the word. Um as everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Dennis McKenna, uh, founder of the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Uh, check out the new reprint of Food of the Gods. Definitely check out the website, which we'll link to in the bio, and all the, the fascinating virtual conferences that have been going on uh, for the last year. Um, Dennis, it, once again, it was it was great seeing you. Um, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. Uh, thanks for everything you're doing. And as, as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create the better tomorrow. Uh, we're, I'm rooting you on. I want to help you spread the word. Just uh, really always fascinating talking to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ira. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and, and thanks for letting me use your platform to get this message out, too. Uh, I, I put the address of the academy into the chat box, and yep. basically, I would ask people to check it out, you know, and see what's there. We've, we've, you know, like everything else, it's a work in progress, but we have a lot of uh, some of the events and resources there on that website, so folks could learn more about what we're up to there. And um, I look forward to the next time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks very much.